All right, let's start. Uh, welcome everybody to the last session of the day. We will have two more interesting talks. Uh, the first paper is by Agalos Kiyayas, Hongsheng Zhu, and Vasilis Zikas, and Vasilis will give the talk. Thank you, Barry. Uh, so, uh, this is about fair and robust MPC using a global transaction ledger, or an alternative title, using cryptocurrency blockchains. So this is joint work with uh, Agilos and Hongsheng. And the main question I will try to so address here is, what is the functionality that we get from such a ledger-based cryptocurrency, from a blockchain? So what can blockchain give us that we can use in crypto? And uh, in this talk, I will use Bitcoin and ledger-based cryptocurrency and blockchain all interchangeably. So whatever statement I make, whenever you see Bitcoin, it applies also to any ledger-based cryptocurrency. So the two main functions of such a cryptocurrency are a public transaction ledger, uh, which can be thought of as a bulletin board with a, a filter of what can go in, and some economic stuff that we understand way less than the transaction ledger. And they mainly have to do with the fact that in there is some monetary value in contents of the ledger, and people, whether good or bad, whether good or adversarial, want to make money. So this is based on a, on, a, on, a, on a basic principle of the economic theory that when it comes to money, people are rational. Of course, there are exceptions in this rule, but uh, this in general is a good rule. And by the way, disclaimer, I'm not you know, making any statement here since I want to go back to the US after Eurocrypto. Okay. So let's start with the public transaction ledger. I claim that the core security goal of Bitcoin is to ensure that all parties can establish a common and irreversible view of the sequence of transactions. So if we have that, we have a cryptocurrency. And this is what uh, in a recent uh, paper by uh, Garay, Kayas, and Leonardos was called the backbone property of uh, Bitcoin. And again, whenever I say Bitcoin, I mean arbitrary cryptocurrencies. So our first con contribution is to capture this security goal by means of an ideal use functionality, a transaction ledger functionality. So how does this look like? What is a transaction ledger? It's a functionality that has an internal state that can be queried. So anyone can ask for the state and it gets back the value, the current value of the state, and it can be updated. Anyone can submit transactions. When a transaction gets submitted, it gets added to the state. So this would be sufficient for uh, any cryptocurrency. Actually, the existing cryptocurrencies have slightly more functionality than that. They even implement a filter. So they have a validation predicate. It says that when a transaction comes in, it goes to this predicate. This predicate takes the value, the current value of the state, and decides whether this is indeed a, a valid transaction or not. If it decides that it is, then the transaction gets added to the state. And the state gets updated. So that would be the dream goal of any cryptocurrency. Unfortunately, we don't know if any cryptocurrency that satisfies exactly this goal. There is some adversarial influence in existing cryptocurrencies. And this has to do with the fact that there is a guy, there is an attacker that can reorder recently inserted transactions. So how can we kind of incorporate this into the model? Note that the way we have it there, recently inserted, we cannot decide whether it's recent or not. So what we do is we add to the model a global clock. This is just kind of something that gives us a counter, gives us a, a, a causality of events. And to distinguish recently inserted from older inserted transactions, we split the state to two parts. This is what we now will call the state. This is a part that cannot be changed. The adversary does not have any influence on. And if you know something about Bitcoin, this uh, corresponds to transactions that are deep enough in the blockchain so that they, can, they cannot be changed. And the other component is the buffer which can be influenced by the adversary. Now, when a transaction comes in, it goes again through the validation predicate. The validation predicate takes both the state and the contents of the buffer and decides whether it's a valid transaction or not. If it decides it is, it sends the transaction to the buffer, not to the state, right? The transaction, this gets, the adversary gets informed about this, so the adversary knows both the state via the standard querying uh, sequence and the contents of the buffer, and now he's allowed to permute the contents of the buffer. So now the natural question is, 
how do uh, transactions get from the buffer to the state, what happens is that periodically in our modeling with every activation, the ledger queries the clock to see you know, what time it currently is. It gets back the value of time and every, let's say, t steps, it invokes a special predicate, which we call blockify. So the role of this predicate is to go and fetch the contents of the buffer, massage them a little bit so that, you know, different cryptocurrencies have different ways that things get inserted in the state, maybe throw some back in, the others are flushed, and they're put into the state. So this is uh, our abstraction of a transaction ledger. And having such an abstraction, we can now start discussing about cryptographic protocols that use the blockchain, and in particular use this ledger functionality of the blockchain, and those are simple uh, protocols that are in the G-Ledger, G-Clock hybrid model. They have hybrid access to those two functionalities, the ledger and the clock. So this allows us to immediately get the composition theorem because now we're working on a well-established composable model. But looking at it, you might be wondering, you know, why is that more useful than just having a broadcast channel, right? I could do whatever the ledger gives me just by having stateful protocols and a broadcast channel. Whenever some transaction I wanted, whenever I wanted to put some transaction in, I broadcast it to the network and, you know, the validation is done locally by the parties. So actually, what makes Bitcoin more interesting for, the, for, for crypto is this economic stuff. And based on this economic stuff, we actually have some better notions of secure function evaluation in this case. So what is secure function evaluation? Uh, I will just go briefly because there were already some uh, MPC SFE talks. Um, we have N parties. Each party has its own private input and they want to compute some function F. In an ideal world, the parties send their inputs to F. F performs the computation and returns the outputs. Now in the real world, the parties do not have such a trusted party, do not have such a functionality, and they, but they can communicate over some network. And the goal of an SFE protocol is to emulate the behavior of this trusted party. So we want the protocol to have the same output of the parties, even when some of the parties misbehave. And cheating parties should not get more information than what they would get by the evaluation of the function, namely no more than the output. Okay, so now, when do we say that such a protocol is fair? Intuitively, when the following holds. If the adversary gets any information from the computation more than what he can deduce by his own inputs, then every honest party should get the output. And to give you some intuition of what this means, this means that this situation cannot, cannot, uh, cannot uh, occur. So it cannot be that the adversary gets the output and the honest parties do not get it. So this we would call an unfair situation. Uh, from early results, from uh, 86 clips result, we know that if we want to have security against arbitrary corrupted majorities, then fairness goes out of the window. We cannot have fairness for corrupted majorities. So because we do want to have protocols for corrupted majorities, what we usually do is we consider a discounted security notion, which is the so-called security with a board. And in this security notion, the adversary is explicitly allowed to provoke this situation for us. So he can get the output and make the honest parties abort. So now, how can we use this uh, monetary, this connection of the, of, the, of the transaction with actual money to make this a better, get a better solution for this problem? This idea comes from uh, Andrichovitz, I think, et al. What? Andrichovitz, I was close, okay. From uh, Andrichovitz et al. And the idea is that we can actually use coins, we can use money to leverage this discount that we do on security. And this leads naturally to the notion of uh, SFE with fair compensation, which says that, as before, if the adversary learns something more than his inputs, then every honest party should learn the output, or he should get money from the adversary. So if we think of the scenario we had before, the motivation is as follows. So why is that situation unfair? Because if the adversary gets the output and the honest parties do not get the output, then obviously the honest parties are unhappy and the adversary is happy, like very simplistically. If we add coins to this picture, suddenly the adversary transfers coins to the honest parties when this happens, and now the honest parties 
provided that they value coin a lot, they are happy, and the adversary is, you know, at least skeptic. He's given away money, and this situation we'll call fair. Now, if you think of the adversary kind of having some incentive not to give away money, then you can easily see that this situation is a deterrence factor for the adversary to provoke an unfair board, right? Because he's losing money. So actually, under assumptions on the adversary being rational, this will yield a fair solution because the adversary will not abort. Okay. So how can we get a protocol which has this guarantee? Uh, this was described in the generality of uh, SFP for any function by Bentoff and Kumarasan in two consecutive papers, uh, 2014 and 15. And I will just give you the high level idea here. The protocol proceeds in two stages. In the first stage, the parties compute a sharing, an authenticated sharing of the output of the function. That is, every, they compute the following functionality. Functionality takes inputs from the parties, computes the function, but doesn't output the function. It outputs a sharing of the function, which is authenticated. So every party receives a share. This share has no information on the output, but he also receives a signature for which he doesn't know the signing key. So he cannot lie about his share. It's easy to see that uh, when this is a the situation, then if we are bored at this point, we haven't violated fairness, right? Why? Because the adversary has received nothing. He just has a share which gives him no information. So now the tricky part is to reconstruct this share in a way which is fair with compensation, as we described before. So either the output will be constructed or parties will get compensated. And there is the block, the, 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 that's where the blockchain will help. The idea is to proceed in two steps. In a first step, every party PI makes a transaction towards every other party PJ, all other parties PJ, which is as follows. PJ can claim, can spend this transaction, can spend the coins that are transferred to him only up to a fixed round. Remember, like Bitcoin gives, has time. We have time with the ledger, so we can put a timestamp there. Only up to some time. And only by announcing his valid share, announcing a share and a valid signature on it. If the receiver, PJ, does not announce his share by round row IJ, then the money, get, the money get refunded to the sender. In other words, after this time, the sender can spend the money unconditionally, no need to announce it. So having done these transactions, uh, the protocol proceeds as follows. Every party claims the coin that were addressed to him by just announcing his share. Right? At, by, by the round, right, J, each J will just broadcast, like put on the ledger a transaction which includes his share and the signature, and this way we'll collect all the money from all parties. So it's relatively easy to see that uh, this protocol achieves uh, security with fair compensation just by kind of following the money. If the adversary announces all his shares, right, if he collects all the money, then what happens is that in the first step of this reconstruction process, everyone transfers N coins, one to each party, and in the second step, everyone collects N coins, one from each party that sent it to him, and therefore he has zero balance, and since the adversary has announced everything, he has the output. Now, if the adversary does not announce a share, then what happens is that he doesn't collect the coins corresponding to this share, these coins go back to the sender, and the senders now, the honest senders, have a positive balance. So they won't have their output because the adversary did not announce his share, his share but they will have more coins than what they started with. So this is the underlying idea of these protocols, and it does indeed get uh, security with fair compensation, but it has an issue. And to see the issue, it's, it's, it's uh, constructive to see kind of the timeline of this protocol. So th here's how the protocol proceeds with time. At some point, the protocol starts, let's say at time zero, and it starts computing the sharing of the output of the function, right? Depending on the protocol we're using, this might take a few seconds. After a few seconds, maybe minutes, depending on what we're using. But after just a little bit of time, the sharing is computed. Everyone has his share. And now they start making the uh, transactions of the first step that can be then claimed by announcing in the, in the end. They make the transactions. They can act upon these transactions only when these transactions are actually solid. And they cannot be changed. So only after they're in the state, which is roughly one hour later. And at that point, they can start claiming their transactions, and several hours later, they will have the output or they will be compensated. Several 
is a constant in the is a linear in the number of parties in the first papers and constant in the, in the in the later papers. So this is good. Looks like we have everything that what we want. But notice the following: What happens if the adversary at this point simply doesn't make any transaction? Right? We compute the sharing, and now we're about to make transaction. The adversary doesn't speak. The parties can only act upon this behavior after it's steady and agreed upon, which is only after an hour. So they have to wait for an hour to be sure that everyone has recognized this behavior. And you know they can actually reclaim everything after several hours. We could bootstrap this to reclaim already after two hours or something. But still, what have we gotten? The adversary just aborted with a single party. The parties have wasted, all honest parties have wasted two hours of their life doing nothing. No compensation, no output. And if we try to kind of bootstrap this, you know, what we could trivially do would be, you know, detect who was the party that aborted and restart. But since we want to tolerate corrupted majorities, in the worst case, we will restart linear number of hours, right? Linear number of times. Each time we restart, we need to spend an hour. So linear number of hours, which is way more than parties would be willing to take. So if we look again at the motivation of uh, fairness with uh, compensation, now we're in a scenario where parties not only don't get their coins, but they wait for no reason. And they wait really long if they really want their output. And they're pissed for that. On the other hand, the adversary well, has succeeded. Right? He has done what adversaries do. He has disrupted the computation. He has done a, a successful denial of service attack. And he's more happy than before even. So this situation is not clear whether we would call fair. So it definitely is not a clear deterrence factor for the adversary. So in this work, we introduce uh, SFP with robust compensation, where the idea is just strike out the conditional statement for SFP with fair compensation. We want, independent of whether the party, the adversary gets his output or not, every party learns the output or gets money, no matter what. Once the protocol starts, the protocol will terminate either with output or with money from the adversary to honest parties. And now the question is, can we get this robustness fast? I said just before that we can get it by rewinding, like in, uh, in a linear number of hours. Can we get it in a constant number of hours, or just as fast as we would, we would need to run a, a, any semi-honest protocol? The answer is yes. And uh, I will demonstrate. So what we have is a compiler that takes any semi-honest protocol, pi, and transforms it into a protocol with robust compensation which satisfies the, the, the property I described before. So our compiler kind of imitates the GMW compiler. If you don't know what the GMW compiler is, it doesn't matter. I will explain what the compiler does here. So what we do is we start with a pre-processing phase. It does not have any bitcoins, and there's no fairness included there. And in that phase, we compute a setup, which includes com coin flipping, essentially. It includes parties being committed to the randomness for running the protocol. Pi. And then, in the first round of the protocol, every party for every round of the protocol Pi makes a transaction towards all other parties. And PJ can spend his corresponding coin that, is, uh, that, that should be for round R by, first of all, posting something in round R. And by this something, including a valid pi message, and the non-interactive zero knowledge proof that this is a valid pi message. So this is the first step. So now what parties can do is, similarly to the solution that we had before, they can start claiming the coins that were addressed to them by simply playing the protocol on the ledger. Just post their next message on the ledger, and this way they get back the coins that they sent to them. So it's easy to see that the validation predicate, actually what it does is just checks that the, that the parties that post transactions follow the protocol. So it's either you can think of it as uh, a party running the GMW protocol with no input or just as an observer of the GMW protocol that looks that the zero knowledge proofs are correct. Okay, so now why, is that protocol, why does that protocol achieve security with robust compensation? I will start with the, with the easy case. Um, so 
let's assume for a moment, so I'm now kind of swiping away the problem, but let's assume for a moment that the adversary correctly makes all the committing transactions in round one, all those conditional transactions that can be claimed by parties make, uh, running the protocol. In that case, again, security follows just by you know, following the money. What happens is that every party for every round makes a transaction to every to all other parties where each party can claim by playing his protocol. So if everyone now cl plays his protocol, everyone claims back the same number of coins that he, uh, he transferred in the beginning. And if the adversary doesn't play the protocol, he won't claim his coins for the round that he doesn't play. They will be refunded to the actual sender. So now the trickiest uh, scenario is the one in which uh, some corrupted party does not make the transactions as he's supposed to. And that was kind of the similar scenario we had before, right? Where the adversary just aborted before making the transaction. And it might kind of look that we have a similar issue as before, but we don't. And the reason we don't is that we can tweak the validation predicate so that it does the following. It looks at the transactions that were posted in round one and splits the parties into islands that made consistent transactions, mainly that made, namely that they made transactions for the same setup and for the same protocol continuation. So now all honest parties will post consistent transactions, so they will be on the same island. And now what the validation predicate will do is it will run SFE, and it will observe SFE independently on its island, right? So now the adversary has two options. Either he can go play with the cool kids, right, with the honest parties and get the output, or he can just play with his own parties and get nothing. Because if he's on the island of the honest, of the honest parties, the output will depend on his value. If he's not, the output will depend then just on, on the values of the corrupted party, and uh, therefore it's fully simulated. Uh, so this is a, a very rough intuition uh, of, of, uh, of the protocol security, and I don't have too much time more, so I will summarize. Um, what, we, uh, uh, what we did here is we gave a generic description of a transaction ledger as a GUC functionality. Uh, because it's a GUC functionality, we have the first composable model for security with fair and with robust compensation, a notion that we introduced. We describe a compiler that compiles any semi-honest protocol to a protocol which is uh, secure with robust compensation and has the same number of rounds as the semi-honest protocol, but now on-chain, so the same number of hours as rounds in the semi-honest protocol. And of independent interest, actually, we, we have a full-fledged synchronous model in the GUC setting with a global clock, which could be very useful for designing synchronous protocol that all have the, share the same clock. And with that, I'd like to thank you. Any questions, quick questions? So in, in, in the drawing, in, in the first version, uh, in, 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 your, in your diagram of, of the first version, the, the previous work, mm -hmm. um, it, it looked as if, as if it, each round in this revealing of the shares took, took a long time because you had to wait for the transactions to become stable. Uh, so in, in your solution now, when you do this phase round of the actual protocol, does this mean now, now each round in the compiled protocol takes an hour? Yes, okay. each round takes an hour, but the trick is that at the end of the round, I can look at what's on the ledger, I meaning the validation predicate, and split the parties into parties that did execute this round and parties that didn't. So I can go on. So the whole point is that I, I, don't, I never need to, rest, to restart. As soon as I start making transactions, I will go until the end. Yeah. Is there anything that prevents the islanding solution from being applied only on the last round to, to essentially get, get your recovery on the previous scheme? Yes, the, the, of course there is. The thing is that what do the previous schemes have? They have a sharing of the output. So as long as someone drops off, whatever the other parties have has no information on the output anymore. So there's no way to bootstrap and go on from that. You need actually to make the entire computation at the beginning. Right? What did you have? You had a sharing of the output. That's all you have. Unless you use your inputs again, which means running again the protocol, you cannot do anything. Okay, no more questions. Then let's thank the speaker again. And, and we move on to the last talk.